Welcome to the Neurosurgeon's Journey, part of the Library of Brain and Spine Group's Medical Student Neurosurgery Training Center and a collaboration with the AANS's Young Neurosurgeons Committee. I'm your co-host, Michael Quartz. I'm currently the Senior Student Director of Education Resources for MSNTC, and shortly we'll be joined by your other co-host, Dr. Jeremiah Johnson. He is an Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery at the Baylor College of Medicine and is the current Chair of the YNC. We're happy to have you with us as we look deeper into the rewarding life of a neurosurgeon and explore what it takes to get there. So our topic for today is talking about the peculiarities uh, and particular challenges of international medical grads or IMGs um, and what they face in trying to attain a neurosurgery residency spot here in the United States. Um, we've got two guests with us today. Uh, the first is Dr. Panos Karazudis. He's a PGY3 neurosurgery resident at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. He is originally from Greece and graduated from the Medical School of Athens. He has also completed a master's degree in clinical and translational science from the Mayo Graduate School. Panos, how are you today? Good, good. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very excited to be with you today. Thanks so much for being on. Um, the second guest is Dr. Grégoire Chaton. He's a PGY4 neurosurgery resident at the University of Colorado. He's originally from France and graduated from Barts in the London School of Medicine at the University of London before completing a postdoc at the NIH in the surgical neurology branch. He has also earned a master's degree in radiation biology from the University of Oxford and completed his bachelor's degree in Canada. Greg, how are you? Good, good. Thank you for having us. A plus uh, on the pronunciations of their names, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> so uh, we really appreciate you guys being on. The motivation for this episode came from a, a, the webinar series that Dr. Johnson is putting on through the Young Neurosurgeons Committee. So Dr. Johnson, do you want to start a little bit, you know, talking about where the motivation came from and, and why you think today is a useful conversation? Yeah, well, I mean, this is a certainly an extremely common topic whenever you talk out in quote unquote public where people can see a topic related to neurosurgery and medical students um, and, and comment. And so that's, been the case with our webinar series that we have over at Young Neurosurgeons with NREF, where we talk about, you know, what is neurosurgery, who wants to go into it, tips for how to get into it. And it's, and it's just an incredibly common question to ask um, how to get into neurosurgery if you're uh, in the United States, if you're an international medical graduate. I don't think there's really a lot of information out there on this topic per se. Um, and it's a complicated process, uh, particularly from the perspective of, um, you know, someone that's not embedded in the U.S. medical um, student system, where you can learn these things, uh, you know, a bit, a bit more my word of mouth. So I can understand how it'd be very confusing and um, challenging slash daunting to, to figure out how to even go about matching the United States. And so I think probably the best way to learn that is to talk to people who have done it that can maybe walk people through their experience. Um, although there may not be a formula per se, um, I bet there's some commonalities about how to do that. So that's why we wanted to chat with these two gentlemen who've done it um, recently uh, and, and see if that could help some other folks. It's a great overview. So we always like to start with talking about people's paths to neurosurgery itself. Um, so we'd love to hear that. Uh, <clears throat> to that end, you guys can pontificate a little on the path to the United States in general and, and why you came here to train? Yeah, absolutely. I'll be, I'd love to. Um, so as you, as you uh, stated uh, uh, earlier, um, I did my med school in Athens. Um, I entered, uh, I was admitted to med school in 2008, actually. And then early on, actually in med school, I knew that I wanted to, you know, pursue um, clinical experience and perhaps residency outside of Greece. So the first important decision I think in my life was um, in this direction was to take the steps early on actually during med school um, and uh, make sure I, I try to get, you know, great, you know, good scores. Um, and then after that, um, I try to, you know, during, uh, towards the end of the med school, I wanted to make sure I can get some clinical experiences, uh, experience in the United States and pursue um, electives. Um, I did three, actually. I did one at Hopkins, one at Mayo, one at uh, NYU. And uh, so that gave me kind of a little bit more experience, exposure, uh, not only to the American health system, but also, you know, interact with residents, interact with patients, get to practice my English. And then finally, you know, make connections about what am I going to do after I graduate from med school? 
because that's I think that's the first important step um, that people like in our shoes uh, need to, uh, need to know and tease out. I think the earlier the better. Um, after I finished um, med school, um, I um, I started actually at Mayo doing research, um, and I started working with Dr. Mohammed Biden, who's one of the consultants by neurosurgeons here. Um, and the plan was to essentially do like what is called a research fellowship, essentially, you know, being devoted like 100% of my time to, you know, pursue, it was mostly clinical research, but also some transnational stuff in animals. Um, and uh, the plan was to do about two years. And then at the end of the two years, I applied. And by the time I, you know, fortunately started residency, it was a total of three years, essentially, that I did research um, at Mayo. In the meantime, the Mayo had also, uh, the graduate school had a, a graduate program um, in clinical and translational science that involved a lot of statistics, designing studies, um, you know, things like that. And so that also, that was a total of two years with a, a thesis at the end that I defended. Um, and so uh, that also gave me an extra boost, not only for my skills, for the research itself, but also another creden credential that helped me, I think, uh, by the time I was applying. So this is roughly my journey. Thank you so much. Um, it was very concise. Greg, how about you? Um, it's a little bit different, but there might be some parallels there. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a little different. I, I just want to start with by saying that how relevant uh, this subject is, um, especially, you know, as I would have liked to listen to such an episode when it was time for me to apply about four years ago. Because um, like Dr. Johnson said, uh, you know, we're in the dark. We have no idea how the system works. And um, I'm sure it was the same for Panos, but we had to teach everything, you know, ourselves. Um, so um, I had a little bit of an edge because my family moved to the States about 18 years ago, where my parents currently live in DC. Um, I went to med school in London, like you said. Uh, and one of the reasons I, I went to the UK is because for a very long time, I thought my family was going to move back to Europe. Anyways, um, so it, it, Towards the middle of my medical school, you know, my parents decided to stay in the States and have a long career over there. So I decided to move back to, to America and practice medicine. Uh, as an IMG, uh, you know, practicing medicine in America is, is seen as this impossible task, let alone, you know, matching a neurosurgery. Uh, a lot of people will, will discourage you uh, to try to go in the States because it's a very expensive process and, and, and people will tell you it's, it's impossible. And you're going to waste your money, you're going to waste your, your time. But it is doable, as you can tell from Panos and I's experiences. So I, um, my, my dad had back surgery during my second year of med school. And he had his back surgery at, at Georgetown um, by one of the neurosurgeons over there, Dr. Riyadz, this great guy. And uh, he told him about you know, my, my will to uh, want to practice medicine and neurosurgery in the States. And, and Dr. Riyadz has actually offered me a, a two weeks observership. And that really sealed the deal for me. And that's when I, I really, uh, you know, uh, told myself that I was gonna work very hard, you know, towards the goal of neurosurgery in the States. Um, so obviously, like Pano said, you have to tease out what you need to do. Uh, essentially, you need to, to define the fact that you have to take, you know, the boards, you have to uh, score very highly, especially as an IMG, as you have a chip on your shoulder and you need to prove to the American system and to the other Americans, you know, interviewing you that you belong there, you know. And you also have to do your sub eyes, get letters of recommendation and get the, the right connections. And also the research, research is a big important thing. So once you have planned out everything, uh, then you, you, can, you, can, you can work towards that goal. And I think organization skills is, is something I learned through the processes, you know, organizing your sub eyes. I did three sub eyes. I did, um, I did one at the NIH, uh, one at Georgetown and Cleveland Clinic, sorry, four sub eyes. And then the fourth one was GW. Um, and then apply to, to residency from, from there on. And then between my med school and uh, residency application, uh, like you said, I spent a year at the NIH and that also allowed me to, to, to put a foot in the door uh, for sure. You highlight, you guys both highlight a lot of good info there um, that we can get into for both pragmatic and, and um, maybe bigger picture reasons. But um, I think it'd be good to discuss a little bit about how <laughs> difficult it really is. This is probably, a lot of this information is going to be important for people applying to neurosurgery, but really any complicate, uh, uh, competitive surgical subspecialty in the United States. So it might be good to discuss a little bit about what the normal 
uh, just what the data shows. So as you said, it's very difficult. And um, from what I've seen, the match rate is anywhere from, you know, 25 to 50% any given year for independent applicants in general, meaning um, U.S. grads, uh, osteopathic grads and international medical grads. And you can then break down international medical grads into kind of two groups. You've got your US IMGs and your non US IMGs. So um, US IMGs maybe go to a Caribbean school or, or they're from the United States and then uh, they try to gain a residency spot. Um, and then non US IMGs are uh, kind of where you guys are um, fitting into. So would you guys discuss a little bit more about how? Um, you know, you, you just, you told me a little bit about the, the actual steps you took there, but maybe what was the motivation to really take this daunting step? I think you, like you said, a lot of people are going to discourage applicants from doing this. They're going to tell them that it's impossible. Um, Greg, maybe expand on that a little bit more about how you took that on the chin and used it maybe to, to fuel your, your passion for practicing here? Sure. Um, so I had two main motivating factor. Uh, my number one was my family and I wanted to go back and, you know, live in the States, like I, like I mentioned earlier. And also because in the UK, um, uh, like training into neurosurgery is very difficult. There is a lot of bottleneck the effect. Uh, and, you know, uh, ending, ending a good job in neurosurgery is, 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 is very hard. Uh, so I think the two combining factors really pushed me forward to, to try and, and pursue neurosurgery in the States. Um, the thing is, um, uh, I did not question myself too much because once you start questioning yourself and once you start doubting yourself, this is when I think you are not going to do the maximal, you know, uh, uh, work towards that goal. Meaning that I think it was all about determination organization skills, you know, and resilience and not taking no for an answer. So yeah, I had a lot of background noise from different attendings when I was a med student. Uh, I even one of the neurosurgeons uh, in London told me that I had better chances of being an astronaut than, than you know, matching in neurosurgery in the US. Uh, and then you listen to all of this and, and you take it with a grain of salt and you know you what you have to do. You have to do your steps really well. So you have to teach yourself everything. You know, uh, step one was very hard uh, coming from Europe. And I'm sure Panos can attest to this because what you learn in medicine in Europe is not necessarily what you, the knowledge you need for step one because there's a lot of basic cli clinical sciences. Uh, and I had one friend who had matched um, a Tuft in internal medicine. And he was, uh, you know, a shoulder I was relying on uh, because he had gone through the process of an IMG and matching in, in, in the States. So that was my main source of information. And then after, once you, you know, uh, go through the whole like step process, et cetera, then you need to figure out when are you going to do your sub eyes, you know, and then organizing all of this as well. Uh, but to come back to your initial question, my two ma uh, motivating factor was my family and, and the fact that I was telling myself I would probably have a better career uh, in, the, in the US as well. Do you have anything to add, Panos? Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. Uh, I totally um, echo uh, Greg's uh, discussion points. Um, I think as Greg said, um, I wanted to say um, also that um, it's very useful to have a guidance as you have embarking into this journey. Um, I myself had um, a medical student who was two years ahead of me, who's now doing, a, he's actually now starting as plastic surgery faculty at the University of, uh, uh, in Cincinnati. But the thing is that, you know, at that time when he was trying to do, you know, general surgery and we were friends and he would, you know, essentially, you know, teach me some basics and he would also himself you know, tell me about his experience in the States. So I think one important thing that, you know, people need to know is if you can identify even a student mentor ahead of you who's older than you and uh, or a resident perhaps who has been through the same thing that you're trying to do, then I think it's very useful. The second thing is, which I think really helped me now in retrospect is try to speak with as many internationals in the United States in the specialty that you want to do uh, as possible um, one for many re one because you want to learn about the different programs because you want to learn about their experiences. Every pe person has a very interesting story to tell here, and many times you know very different stories. And I'll come back to that. Um, and then finally, 
um, to make, you know, connections, people that, you know, perhaps they might help you um, afterwards. If you do a good job, they might help you get an interview when the time comes. What I, what I think it's, uh, you know, very important is uh, there is no, as Dr. Johnson said, there is no formula. In my mind, there are four main pathways that people have done it. And I like usually to use statistics. Um, and I really like, and for the people that are, you know, are listening to us, um, I really like the fact that you have some uh, links on your website about how people can uh, look into the statistics, because I think they give kind of a framework and uh, of what people need to expect when they're doing this, it's because you need a lot of resilience. And when you come here, it's an investment, meaning in my mind, if you come here, you need to make sure that you're invested in what you're going to do and you're going to spend, you know, the time and the money and the sweat and everything and do not come in here, you know, and in any, you know, in any country, not just, you know, here, whether you're going to migrate in another country to do your residency, um, you need to make sure that, you know, you're going to, you know, go for it. If you're coming here just for fun, you know, just a little bit, you know, go, you know, not being devoted to what you're going to do, you're not going to succeed. I think that's very important thing is that you have to be very, um, you have to, you need to have perseverance. So in my mind, coming back to this, the four main pathways, I, you know, there are some people that apply straight out of uh, med school. This is not very common. It's rather uncommon. Um, and sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. I, uh, but typically my experience from those people that I talk, they don't have a lot of very few interviews. And so you're kind of, you know, really anxious about whether you're going to make it or not, just because, you know, everybody knows from the NRMP results, um, from the graphs that the higher, the number of interviews kind of correlates. It does not guarantee a spot, but at least it kind of correlates with the chances of getting a, uh, a finding a spot. The second pathway is uh, people that are doing um, preliminary surgery. And, um, and then they try to find a spot. We have to say at this point, there is a, an attrition rate in neurosurgery. And we talk about this every year, I think, at the big conferences uh, like WNS and CNS. Why do we have attrition rate in neurosurgery residency? I think at some point, one study showed we have 17% attrition rate. And so sometimes people are lucky and they can find an open PGY2 spot um, in a program and then they, you know, they go for it. Um, the third pathway is the research pathway like I did and, you know, Greg did, where essentially you're trying to... Um, boost your CV by uh, showing that you're, you know, more academic, you know, uh, inclined, you're doing research. It's essentially a way to make connections, go to conferences, present your work, you know, be involved in that aspect of neurosurgery. And in my mind, I personally think that this is the most um, statistically speaking um, successful way compared to the other three. And then uh, finally, uh, there is the, the new pathway, which is called the pre-residency fellowship. Uh, which is essentially uh, some programs have it like University of uh, Iowa, Mount Sinai in, uh, in New Mexico, I think. Um, I don't remember which other ones or in Florida, I believe there are some programs where essentially what you do is you do a couple of years of clinical work with some research and you work kind of as a resident, but it doesn't count as a residency. Um, and so you need to start from a PGY-1 afterwards, but the idea is that you essentially, they get to know you at that program more for your clinical uh, uh, work and ethic and everything. And so you have chances of matching more likely at that program or perhaps somewhere else. Oh, that was really good. And yeah, <laughs> and especially for the research, I just wanna say as you know, Mike, you can attest to that. I think things are getting hotter and hotter every year to the point that even American students take a year of med school, we should say now, to do research and you know put, you know work on their CV in that way. It's absolutely true. Um, everything you said, there's a lot of parallels. For I mean, it's competitive for everyone. Um, you know, only seventy percent or so of even U.S. seniors match into neurosurgery. So it's not like yeah. it's you know <laughs> super easy for people on our side. No, no. It's significantly more difficult for independent applicants, and so um, even even more so, which is uh, kind of hard to fathom. And everything you said, those four pathways are, uh, actually a great segue into what I was hoping to talk about next. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a letter to the editor in world neurosurgery that was published just a few months ago from, uh, Ankush Chandra. And 
they talk about the five pathways that uh, foreign medical grads can take to try to maximize their chances to match into neurosurgery here in the United States. And they, they, the four you said were exactly right. Uh, the same ones they said, and then they added one, which is pursue an advanced degree in the United States, maybe mm-hmm. um, getting a PhD or uh, something else, uh, which is similar to what you guys have done as well. Um, so Dr. Johnson, I was wondering if you would maybe contrast and compare maybe a little bit about the the path that they've taken and some of the notes that they've said on, on their, their journey and how that might relate to uh, grads here in the United States and maybe respond to some of the uh, rhetoric that they've, they were receiving as for medical grads and that you shouldn't do it because it's impossible and that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think they're right. It's, it's hard. It's hard for everyone. And I think from the perspective of someone who's, looking for a good residence. Um, I think most programs don't really are pretty agnostic to where the person comes from. They just need to be proven to be excellent. Right. So uh, there's some nursery match statistics that we will probably have an independent episode about so that people will kind of know some of the metrics that you need to hit um, to have a good chance of being successful. But I think if you hit those and they're generally speaking board scores, which that may go away soon, research, letters of recommendation, uh, what else are there? Uh, there's just a handful of them, number, you know, and all these things make you a competitive candidate. And then like, like was alluded to actually, if you get a certain number of interviews, you actually have a pretty good chance of matching. And that number is usually around 10 to 15 in that range. Um, and so you have to make yourself competitive on paper to get that many interviews. And, and, and you just have to hit these metrics, good scores on your boards, while wow, that's still relevant, good research, good letters of recommendation. Um, and and, and the, the reason actually it's interesting that the boards are so important for international grads is because like they alluded to the medicines taught differently in, in other countries. And so the, the US programs wanna know that you have a grasp on medicine the way that it's taught in the United States, right? So I don't, just like it is the case for people that are US students that don't have a home program, you just kind of have to demonstrate these, these basic competencies on the same level as U.S. grads, and, and you're competitive. Um, now, there are a few things that you need to have, as they alluded to. You need to have research, and that's like becoming a more and more important metric for who matches and who doesn't in neurosurgery. There's no question about it, um, even statistically on the match data. Um, and you have to have exposure to U.S. medicine, and some and important people say that you're very good in that setting. So that's where these sub eyes that they go on uh, come into play. Um, I think the, the the research path that they both took is smart, um, you know, it is somewhat of a risk. It's time that you have to spend doing research for the hope that it improves your application, right? But it's smart if you land in a place with a good research, you know, sort of muscles, you know, that, that can really pump out good research and train you that route. B, it's smart in that if you do that in a place that has a neurosurgery program, you, know, you don't necessarily want to do it at a molecular biology lab at Harvard, right? I mean, that's good if you want to be a molecular biologist at Harvard, but it's actually really good to do research in a neurosurgery department for the reason that you get to know these mentors that were into writing you letters and say that you're excellent, which again, needs to get you up to the par with everyone else who would probably spend time in their home residency program to get those letters. Um, so I think all those things can kind of debunk the the some of the rhetoric as you call it um that it's extremely is a very it's impossible to match a nurse or from an international medical graduate now it is very hard and it does take a lot of res- resources and time and not everyone that's an international medical graduate may have that time financial resources uh, and then go through this rigor and then you know be proven to have the resume that they want to be competitive so that's kind of the risk of it in my mind um, but it's not impossible, but it, but it, but it certainly is challenge, more challenging than going through the medical system in the United States without question, more complex. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a really good overview. I, I'm, I think it would be good to maybe uh, nuance a little bit of the data for international medical grads. Um, and so I've got the charting outcomes uh, in the match is published uh, by uh, NLE, by the uh, National, National Resident Matching Program. And um, for non-US IMGs, um, 11 matched and 33 did not match. Um, The mean step one score for match was 243 and and unmatched was 235. Step two is 245 uh, and unmatched was 240. Um, The mean number of abstracts, presentations and publications. Now, um, just a disclaimer, they don't differentiate between those. 
necessarily in terms of peer reviewed publications and abstracts, that sort of thing. But uh, 61 uh, was the average number for matched uh, applicants, whereas 38 was the number for the unmatched applicants. So there's definitely disparity there. And that's actually very, that's, I can't say from a statistical significance standpoint, but the uh, that number is much greater than for any U.S. grad. Um, typically, that's in the 20 to 25 range for um, matched USMD seniors, uh, which shows, uh, as per other uh, data, that shows that um, more uh, foreign medical grads are taking those research years as, as you guys have and as I am uh, as well. And uh, about 95% he says, and one study said that students are taking these uh, research years, depending on the year, um, of course. And that's actually different than um, US IMGs, as I had kind of uh, differentiated those two earlier. Um, the mean number for US IMGs who matched was 28, whereas the mean number who didn't match was 58. So maybe there's a discrepancy there in terms of why you're doing the research year in terms of, you know, maybe trying to make up for a, a low board score or that sort of thing. But those things are uh, very important. As you said, I think it was good to just maybe um, add some numbers to the, uh, what we were trying to say. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, no, I just wanted to um, uh, go back to the point that Dr. Johnson made about having a good grasp of the U S medical system and how it works. That was extremely important when, when I applied and one of the reasons you, you, you show this is obviously doing sub eyes and getting letters of recommendations. The people I have seen as IMGs fail into matching into any sorts of specialty in America are the people who did not have letters of recommendation or, or only just one from the US or who had done just one sub eye. Um, like Dr. Johnson said, you know, it's a financial implication and, and investment, but you, like Vanna said, you need to show maximal dedication and you need to spend a lot of time trying to, you know, sort out your sub eyes and get those letters of recommendation. And then through those sub eyes and letters of recommendation, that's how, you know, you get to do research in the States uh, with the bigger guys as well. Um, and so the, how I ended up working at the NIH is because during my sub I at the NIH, I was offered a, a postdoc fellowship with uh, the guys over there with Dr. Shidi Boina, who's a great guy. And then that, that allowed me to do some like high powered research. So yes, numbers are important, uh, you know, when you look at stats, et cetera. But if you don't have those basic things like letters of recommendation from American, you know, physician attendings, you will not go very far, even if you have, you know, uh, 80 papers or, or et cetera. The other thing I wanted to mention, there's a sixth pathway we haven't really talked about uh, and that I just thought about um, is people who have already done a neurosurgery residency in Europe, for example, or somewhere else and are applying as mature IMGs and doing a second, you know, neurosurgery residency. Uh, and I'm only saying this because, you know, some of our um, uh, listeners may, may, may be in that, in that category. No, thanks for that. And people who do that are <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, you guys are just for taking the amount of time and, and resources that you guys have. Maybe it might be good to shift the conversation just a little bit to talking about actually how to get in plugged into sub eyes and get plugged into the United States healthcare system. Um, a majority of, uh, based on my own research, a majority of uh, international grads are from uh, the Middle East. And I didn't know if there was differences, there were differences in where an international grad comes from in trying to get into the United States. I know you guys are from different areas in Europe and have different pathways. Are there um, different things that people should be cognizant of when they try to get plugged in the United States healthcare system, depending on where they're from? Um, I didn't know if either of you had any insight into that. I don't think it necessarily matter where you're coming from. Uh, I think you need to do a lot of research into sub eyes before you apply uh, and talk to other people, like Pana said, you know, talk to people who have succeeded into matching in neurosurgery as IMGs. Uh, I would say uh, there are some big name programs uh, that will charge you an absurd amount of money for sub eyes, really uh, look into, uh, you know, who you're doing your sub eyes with and, and see, um, you know, 
um, the financial aspect behind it as well. Do you have anything to add, Panos? Um, no, I wouldn't. No, I don't think, you know, expectations in my mind, I think, should be the same. And I, I'm speaking this, uh, you know, because in our lab, we had, you know, international graduates like myself that, you know, wanted to match in neurosurgery. And they are from Pakistan, India, uh, Lebanon, Syria, from, you know, from all over the world. And the expectations are the same. You know, it is true that cultural differences can play a role. Um, in terms of how fast and how easily you get familiarized with the American system. Um, and uh, this is really a matter up to, you know, to the applicant to, to be proactive and, you know, learn, you know, the ways of the system and the, the patients that you're going to be treating. And, um, you know, that, and that's also something important, which I know that right now it's off the chart, but, you know, that also mattered a lot back in the day with the step to CS where internationals used to fail a lot so we could perhaps talk about this especially and you know a lot of people from you know especially from non-english speaking countries or with a bad accent like myself i guess <laughs> they uh <laughs> they they like i think like the fail rates in the step to cs was about 25 30 percent actually the first time for the internationals and usually it was proficiency of the english language I believe now i, I know that this is now not a mand mandated anymore but it may come back and that's just something that uh, it also adds to the point of doing uh, clinical rotations here. Yeah, there was talk of doing it uh, via, you know, virtually the steps to CS. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about it being canceled because of the pandemic. Right. Yeah. So uh, that was actually my next question, because I think that is a big hurdle, um, which we've alluded to during this conversation, <clears throat> is how to prepare for board exams, the United States Medical Licensing Examination. Um, there are three parts. There's one, two, CK, and CS, and then three. How are how did you guys prepare for those examinations? And maybe we can break it down into the written exams, which is step one and two CK, and then the the uh, patient clinical exam, which is two CS. And how how you guys prepared for those, both um, maybe in a cost effective way, as well as um, feeling like you were ready to take it. When you know, where, how did you get to that point, um, Panos? If you want to just expand on that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And this is something that, um, you know, especially when we used to have, you know, uh, rotate, uh, rotating students or, you know, visiting students from all over the world at Mayo. But of course, now this is, you know, because of the pandemic, as we said, this is, you know, has been halted. But um, the first thing I always ask them is when they tell me that they want to do residency in the United States is I ask them, do you have the step one? Um, I was lucky enough that I took step one during early on in med school, and it was very. It was right after the preclinical years, essentially, of my med school, and that's because I, I knew I wanted to come here, and so um, I had set it up in my mind that I need to take it as early as possible for two reasons. One, because you wanted you know the good score, you want to uh, make sure it's close to the clinic, you know, to the preclinical um, coursework that you're doing, and also because a lot of um, uh, rotations right now are mandating a step one um, actually uh, pass uh, before you you know you come here um, as abais like uh, for example at Mayo it's required that you have a step one before you apply for an elective um, you know there is ton of resources resources change I took my step one back in 2012 and that it's like almost a decade ago for yeah it's crazy um, but um, but what, you know, what I would say is, uh, may I would say, I think one of the most useful, I always I tell you know, students is make sure you try to take step one as early as possible. Um, especially if you're still a student, don't wait for graduation and then go back to step one. I do think personal opinion, because a lot of students actually decide late, kind of late to come to the United States. And then they're thinking, mm, maybe I should take step two and then take step one, which, you know, it's feasible. Um, but I think getting step one and then going for step two, I think it's a easier pathway. I don't know what if Greg uh, can also, you know, talk about this kind of uh, the sequence. And yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, you need to if if you're really serious about going to the states uh, to practice medicine and neurosurgery, especially, uh, you need to take step one uh, very early on because all of that basic science knowledge is. It, is a depreciating you know, knowledge, you lose it very quickly. Uh, and it's, it's so hard when you're further into medical school to, to take step one, uh, or should I say much harder. Um, the one 
thing I do want to mention is that, you know, like Dr. Johnson alluded to earlier, step one is good. It's probably going to become obsolete. It's just going to be a pass or fail uh, in two years. So maybe the pressure is a little, you know, off uh, to get like an amazing, you know, uh, sky high board score. However, they're going to care about other things now even more. Um, so that, 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 that's going to be an interesting, uh, you know, era of applications because um, it's, it's going to be totally, uh, totally changed. And especially when looking at applications, like people are going to care about other things that we don't necessarily care today. Um, but to go back to your initial point, like how did I study for it? I, I took it as a end of second year med school. Uh, I took uh, board review courses. Um, and first aid was was my Bible. You know, I had it open. I've every single you know uh, lectures in med school. I would refer back to my first aid. You know, uh, every time we would talk about a subject, and and I studied hard. You know, at night coming back, you know, very late, I would study hard for step one because I I knew it was so important uh, to do well in in the states. And and my friends in in England didn't understand why I was studying so hard. But you have to tell yourself you're doing it for because you know you you want to reach. Uh, something that is that is very hard to get to, but it's very feasible. Um, and then step two, uh, step two for me um, in England, the way you 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 learn medicine is very clinical. So step two was much easier, especially CS, because the way we're we're assessed and evaluated for finals is exactly the way CS works. It's called OSCEs, where we evaluate, you know, we examine patients in front of an examiner. And uh, so that 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 was much easier for me. But step one was definitely the, the giant, um, you know, what's going to happen for IMGs when they apply and it's only a pass or fail uh, assessment for step one scores. To, to talk a little bit about the impact of pass fail for step one, um, actually, our, one, our, one of our previous guests, Akeep Huck, he is a, a MS4 at Johns Hopkins, him and a team, uh, actually published a paper uh, from a survey on program directors in neurosurgery whose, what their perceptions were gonna be of the impact of the pass fail change. And, you know, one of the key ones that I, that stuck out to me was that um, grads from less prestigious schools, um, which could be, you know, really anything, if you, however you define it, but they're gonna be disproportionately affected um, because they're not gonna be able to quote unquote, equal the playing field. And that was one of the big concerns of the change uh, at the onset. So I think that that's something that, you know, students are going to have to be cognizant of and, you know, excel on the step two CK. Right. Um, so that's exactly. So I've heard uh, that theory as well, that, you know, uh, people from bigger name medical school would have more chances in matching in your surgery now. Uh, I don't know whether that's true. Um, I think like you, like you were saying that we're probably going to put more, more emphasis on, on step two scores, you know, and right. we're just going to be shifting uh, our attention to that score. You know, right. everyone is going to have a pass in step one. So now we're going to care more about the step two score. Now, right. when people are applying to neurosurgery, they don't necessarily need to show a step two score, but I think, you know, medical students are going to feel obliged now to show yeah. a very high step two score. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, that'll probably be, you know, who knows? It, it doesn't start until January 2022, but whoever is going to be taking, uh, you know, be applying here in the next couple of years is going to have to take that into account. So um, I think that, you know, to cover your bases, just do all the things that everyone's doing. But um, what doctors, something that Dr. Gabriel Zada from USC said um, in a previous episode is that you just got to do 10% more all the time. <laughs> and uh, as a independent applicant, you maybe need to do 10% more than even other neurosurgery applicants. And so um, it's going to be a long road and you might get a lot of no's and rejections, but you got to keep going. Um, is... Oh, right. Yeah. I don't think anyone knows what that's going to, what effect that will have. I mean, I think generally speaking, uh, when you talk to people around the country who are program directors and the like, they, they typically have some uh, apprehension about the effect that losing step one will have on the folks who aren't U.S. traditional um, medical graduates with, you know, in a residency program, in a medical school that has a residency program and, um, and these types of things. And the reason is, is because the step one is currently used as sort of like a, an equalizer. So if you're at a school who doesn't um, have the pache or cachet, I should say, um, 
of a top 40 NIH funded US medical school, then if you have an outstanding step one score, then people just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, he'll, he'll do well wherever he is, or she will do well wherever she is. Um, without the step one score, the question is gonna be, what will be the next metric that people use to kind of make everyone equal? And will it be one of the other steps? Um, will it be research? Will it be even more heavily weighted towards people with letters of recommendation? I don't think we know that yet, um, but I do think it's in there are pluses and minuses to having it and not having it count as much as it did. And we will just have to see where it goes. I don't think there's anyone really knows for sure what impact that will have, but I think most people think that it could be negative, but until it happens and it all shakes out, I'm not sure we'll know for sure. Do you guys have any uh, insight on how to connect with programs from a, an international standpoint? Sounds sub like, or... yeah, sub eyes or getting connected with the NIH or particular mm -hmm. programs. Is it just emailing program coordinators mm -hmm. and that sort of thing like all grads do, or is there some particular thing that you guys did that was maybe different? Yeah, I think, I think, like I said, you, you have to shop a lot. Uh, around talk to different people who are in different programs uh, if you can find IMGs reach out to them okay. um, I know that every time I get an IMG email I answer right away because um, I were in those shoes you know four right. years ago uh, and I, I know how it feels um, so yeah you can contact programs you won't necessarily always get an answer uh, so when it came to sub eyes um, so Georgetown, um, I had done the two weeks observership and then I converted it to a four week sub after that. Uh, but I already had my foot in the door. I know that they don't like uh, usually IMGs for, for sub -eyes. And then the NIH, I just plain applied to it for a sub okay. Um I didn't know anyone. I didn't send, I mean, I probably sent an email, but I don't think I got an answer. I just yeah. went through the, the whole application process. Uh, and then Cleveland Clinic, exactly the same thing. I just went through the, the whole application process. And then once you're in, then that's when you make connections for right. research and, and for job offers after you know medical school. Because you're gonna the majority of people applying from med school directly into residency are gonna have a gap year. Right. The reason being is that you have to graduate to be able to have an ECMG uh, certificate to be able to apply to residency. And that's a little bit of a nuance. Uh, versus the, the the American you know kids applying to residency where they can apply right. during their fourth year. Um, can you expand then, on that a little bit? Like yeah, what, what that actually is and why it's important. <clears throat> so you need to, and then Panos can uh, uh, you know help me with this, but you need to have what's called an ECFMG certificate, uh, and then uh, to get that you have to have graduated from medical school have taken step one, step two CK, and step two CS. Once you have those four things, then you get that certificate that will allow you to apply to residency. Okay. But to have that, you have to have graduated. Gotcha. So by definition, you're gonna have a gap year. And this is why I was you know, aggressively trying to find a job um, you know, at the end of my medical school. Um, right. So I have two friends who stayed, so they, um, I have two really good friends who matched into orthopedic neurosurgery, um, orthopedic surgery and cardiothoracic surgery in America as IMG. They graduated the same year from the same school as I did. So they were also both successful into matching into surgical specialty. So IMG so they, should just go to your school and <laughs> No, I think I think we 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 were we were a little click, you know, of, of, of a few students trying to make it to America. We had, you know, uh, set up this 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 group call. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember what it was, but it was something about IMGs applying to America. To America. And anyways, we're, you know, uh, doing meetings, etc. And it was very informative. And I think they were trying to help each other. Uh, anyways, my point being is that they stayed in England after they graduated for a year and they worked as physicians, first year physicians in England. Whereas, you know, after my sub-I at the NIH, you know, um, one of the guys approached me and said, hey, do you want a job, you know, for a year, you can help me in the lab. You've had some research experience at Oxford. You published in like in high impact papers, et cetera. And then that's well how I ended up, you know, uh, doing that one year uh, interim. Um, so yeah, like connections is important. Putting your foot in the door with sub eyes, getting good letters, et cetera. Um, great. What about you, Panos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I totally agree with Greg. Um, what I want to say is, uh, you know, that's a very good question. Ultimately, I think I, at least from my experience, my mentor, and the person that I worked under, you know, the mentorship under, 
is one of the most critical things. If you decide to do the research pathways, one of the most critical things you can do for your career ultimately, and be very careful on how you're going to choose that person. And obviously that person is going to choose you because if you do a really good job and you show that, you know, you are determined to do this and give your whole self kind of essentially into this, then you're going to get back. That, and that's one of the most rewarding things I think about being in the States, which is being rewarded uh, and meritocracy um, for the most part, uh, you know, uh, we're not talking about exceptions, but, you know, there's going to be, you know, reward if you do, if you work hard. Um, you know, whether you're an international or an American, uh, I'm talking about uh, in general. And right. so, um, you know, definitely my, thanks to my mentor, not only I was able, you know, to get my research fellowship, have a stipend. That's other important thing that we need to mention to the internationals, which is uh, like myself, although I had a, a set up research job, that doesn't mean that in the meantime, I didn't make sure that I email other people. And you sometimes you just start with generic emails. And I remember when I was a research fellow, I was re uh, receiving, you know, hundreds, you know, of emails of people just, you know, where essentially you just send 100 emails to uh, programs around the country, and you're hoping that at least 10 of them will get back to you. Then nine out of 10, it's going to be an unpaid job, uh, where you're going to have to support yourself probably for a year. Um, and then many times, you know, based on a grant that you're either going to write or your consultant may have, you know, during that time you are there, they might be able to fund you. So in my mind, um, I think statistically speaking, again, uh, you need to do um, two years of research. That's my opinion. I don't think that one, and by one year, I mean that you come for a few months into that program and then you apply after three, four months, and then you're hoping that you're going to match or you're going to get those good letters. I think you need to spend that extra time in that institution where you're going to do your research to make sure, for all these reasons we have mentioned already. So that's one. The second, sometimes you might be able to get a paid job up front, but most of the time I tell students you have to be prepared. And that's how it works for me too. You have to be prepared to support yourself for a year. And that can make a difference depending on where you're going to do this. For example, New York versus Rochester, where I am right now. Um, and then be careful how you, you know, as again, as I, you, you choose your mentor, because uh, thanks to my mentor, I also was able to get more interviews. Ultimately, there's going to be uh, a person who's going to picking up the phone for you and call programs to give you an interview. And that's also something we can talk more about this. And perhaps you left it for the last part of this interview which is your goal is, in my mind, is to get the interview. Once you get the interview, you're playing now at a different level, uh, you know, meaning, you know, programs have determined now that you're good on paper. And now the question is, are you a good fit? Can you match? So I think in my mind, you're doing all this work, at least the initial one, to make sure you get the interview. Because as we said, the number of interviews you get correlate um, with also, you know, your chances and programs you may like, et cetera. What do you think, Greg, about about this aspect? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Uh, you need to do everything uh, to get through that door, that interview door. Once you're through that interview door, they just want to see that you're a good guy who can have a normal conversation, um, you know, and uh, who's going to bring something to the residency program. Um, I think, yeah, the, the hardest part, like Pena said, is, is getting that interview. But once you go, you get those interviews, then then you, you should be fine. Are there any particular questions that you guys received as being international medical grads that you think future so, IMG should be aware of or things that they should think about in the, the interview? The number one question I was asked at every single interview is why are you trying to come to the U.S. to practice? And you need to have a very good answer for this. For me, it was from, you know, a personal perspective, my family. And then uh, also because I thought I was going to have a, you know, a better career uh, because there were bottleneck effects, like I said, in the UK. But you can't say, for example, oh, because salaries are, are high in the States. Like that, that, that will not fly. You need to have a very good uh, answer because again that that's the number one question you're going to be asked why are you trying to come to, come to the states to practice neurosurgery what about you Panos? yeah that's the one that's the first question and the other question that people need to be prepared for is um how do you think these years of med school are going to affect you 
in your clinical performance. So if let's say like, for example, I was two years, essentially three years out of med school um, until I started, that's also another common uh, question. And again, um, there is no you know, um, bad answer. As long as you have an answer, I don't think that anybody is gonna say, oh, that guy is two or three years um, out of med school, so she's not gonna perform well. I don't think that's true. I think you can pick up um, you know, your clinical uh, performance pretty quickly just because you work so hard and you work so many hours that you know, it's part of the system that you know, part of the process that you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna pick up um, in that aspect. You know, even as you said, uh, uh, Mike, uh, people do a PhD, which the median time here is the United States is five years. So how do people, you know, come back to a clinical experience, you know, uh, experience after five years. And I think in my mind, the answer was trying to show that you were engaged, you went to the conferences, which is also something that we can perhaps talk about is once you go into the program that you're going to do, let's say your research or, you know, any, anything else um, you need, if you really, if you, I think in my mind, the highest chances you have at matching is at the program you're doing your research in, if you decide to stay. Now, of course, I understand that there are, might be some programs that um, might not be as IMG friendly. Your highest chances are in the program I think you're doing, just because people know you there and slowly with time, you can get to know the people, interact with them, maybe do papers, go to the conferences, get to know the residents, um, get to know the people, um, and that also will, you know, will take some, you know, will take some time, but. And um, I think it's important, like the number one question I'm asked very often when I speak to IMGs trying to get into neurosurgery is how many interviews I ended up getting. And that's probably a way for them to gauge, you know, what the chances are. Uh, and I ended up getting, you know, 17 interviews. Uh, and like I said, you have a very interesting story uh, to tell during interviews. People were very happy to have a conversation with me. Uh, and I ended up getting a lot of traction. Um, surprisingly, I was not expecting this. And uh, I got five calls from different program directors uh, after the whole interview uh, season and prior to um, ranking. And I ended up matching at my top choice. Colorado was my you know, number one uh, residency program I wanted to go to. And obviously, I was ecstatic about the, the outcome of the, the whole process. So uh, it's definitely doable. So Greg, um, I think a aspect of this that is coming out uh, in this conversation is the financial burden that um, all applicants face, but probably to a more greater extent, international medical grads. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very good question, Michael. And it's something that you know, we overlook uh, talking about is is how expensive is it to to apply to the states and the whole process. Uh, it is very expensive, and that's why a lot of people don't end up doing the whole process. They end up just taking step one, and that's it. Um, so again, it is dedication. is It has certainly a uh, big financial impact on you. Um, so. The steps are expensive. Uh, unfortunately, you're gonna have to find the resources uh, of, of paying for those. Like American kids, everyone has to pay for those. Uh, the one thing, I, I would say the two things that are very expensive, especially for IMGs, is uh, doing sub eyes, so rota away rotations. Uh, where do you do your away rotations and how do you choose them? Uh, I think that's also important. I did a lot of research uh, when it came to doing my sub eyes uh, and try to pick places where it was going to be cheaper uh, for me to go to. For example, all of the uh, you know programs I, I went to for my four sub eyes, they were free. There are other you know places that are very expensive. They'll charge you between four thousand and five thousand uh, dollars just for four weeks, and I wanted to avoid that because I didn't have the you know, the, 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 the cash to do so. Um, so, like I said, I chose programs that, you know, if you got in as a sub eye, then it would be free. Even clinic, clinic, uh, Cleveland Clinic was paying for your own accommodation, I mean, for your accommodation. And I also chose programs close to my, my home, you know. There was one way I also dealt with, you know, the financial hit uh, is by staying with my parents. So, one thing you can also do is if you know someone in the area, maybe you would be more inclined in, in applying, you know, to sub eyes in, in, in that specific region. Uh, that way you can stay with family, friends or friends that you know 
um, and that would certainly absorb some some of the cost associated to this. And then um, coming to you know the whole interview process, you know, let's say you have 15 interviews, you know, it's it's going to be very very hard financially to go to these interviews uh, uh, from you know from wherever you're applying. For example, if you're in London, if you're in Greece, Athens, or even in the Middle East. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, um, how are you going to, you know, pay for 15 flights? Uh, you're going to have, I mean, either you have to have a lot of money or you have to take out a loan or uh, you are already in the system, already on American soil, which I think is probably the best option. And that was one of the reasons as well that I chose to do, you know, something after med school in America, because you're already, you know, you have already a foot on the ground uh, and it, it makes the whole process much cheaper. You know, you don't have to pay international flights for 15 interviews on top of all the hotels you have to stay at. And um, the way I also dealt with, you know, the, the, the cost of, of interviewing was, was to take out a, a small loan uh, that I paid back pretty quickly. Uh, but unfortunately, that, that's, that's the way it is. And, and even, you know, even for American uh, kids applying to residency, it's, it's a very expensive process, whether you're applying for internal medicine or neurosurgery. Yeah, the median uh, cost is, you know, anywhere from eight to 10 grand. And in a normal year, obviously, the pandemic has changed some of that. But that's really good, Greg. I really appreciate you talking about that. I know it's a difficult subject. And sure. Uh, is something that we need to be, um, of course, yeah. As, as we as we apply, so um, so to, to kind of summarize our the rest of our conversation uh, our conversation to this point. So take step one early, um, especially if you're taking it within between now and January 2022 before it moves to pass fail. There are really six pathways um, for international medical grads to take before coming to the uh, United States, so they can come straight out of med school. Um, they can complete residency training prior to neurosurgery, as Greg had said. They can do postdoctoral fellowships, pursue an advanced degree, um, do a pre-residency fellowship, um, much like you guys did, and then do extended clinical experiences in the United States. Um, make sure you get the ECFMG uh, certificate. Um, you got to take step one, uh, step two, CSCK, and graduate before you can get that. And then try to do as many sub eyes, you know, three, four or five, if you can, um, in the United States and do uh, and get letters from people in the in those fields. Um, contact as many people as you possibly can. Um, it's kind of a numbers game trying to just get as many people to, to connect with you and, and reach out to international grads to, to get advice on on the pathway. Uh, and then do um, try to get as much research experiences as you possibly can. Um, is there anything that I missed there that you think would be good to summarize? Um, um, I, as an IMG, you have an interesting story to tell. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're from a different background than the rest of the applicants. Mm -hmm. um, and people care about this, you know, uh, and that's what I've seen on, on the trail. You know, people were really interested in having a conversation with me. So, the one thing I do want to mention is it don't don't get discouraged by the process. It's it's definitely worth it. Panos, okay, do you have anything to add? No, I think that was uh, an excellent summary, uh, Mike. Um, I think that we you know we discussed about the the major points that somebody needs to have in mind. Um, what I was just gonna say is, um, as Greg said, it's a it's an it's a process that's worth the time and the effort and everything. Um, and ultimately, um, it needs careful planning. Um, and it also needs just at the end of the day, you know, you might say that the chances still very low, you know, for especially for foreign medical graduates, but, you know, also for American medical graduates, you know, things are hard. And so, you know, you always need to have a plan B and a plan C, at, you know, at the end of the day to make sure you know that your time that uh, the effort and everything is not going to waste so well you need careful planning the whole process i would say that's an a very in, you know a very important point that we need to drive home for imgs listening to us is, is careful planning you know organization skills and showing resilience people care about this you know uh, it's all that that process is all about resiliency for for, for imgs um, Dr. Johnson, do you have anything to add to, to con conclude what we've, we've talked about? Um, yeah, I do. I have a couple of quick thoughts great. that I think could kind of help bring things home, so to speak. So 
One thing I do think it's important to mention is that at least in my experience, neurosurgery as a field really tries to um, reward hard work slash be a meritocracy. Um, I really do think that's true. I, I think that the field generally overlooks things like where you went to medical school and um, in, in favor of people rising through the ranks, proving themselves with hard work and accomplishment. So what I would say is that number one, uh, don't be afraid of your own story. I think people, neurosurgeons like, like uh, Gregory kind of mentioned, neurosurgeons really like to hear this story of coming from another country and, and, and navigating this complex process, doing really well and being there in front of them as a, as a new and diverse and interesting person to add to the mix of neurosurgery with different talents and viewpoints. I think that, I think that they value that. Um, the second thing is, is though, is that when you are given these opportunities, if you've figured out how to navigate this system um, and you are um, about to start your research fellowship, you really need to hit that out of the park, right? You can't just do it and put a line on your, on your CV that you just did a research fellowship. I mean, you need to publish, you need to go to conferences, you need to network, you need to maximize all these opportunities. Um, you know, see if you can volunteer to spend time on the clinical service where you're doing your research fellowship. I mean, just continue to churn and churn and churn and churn. And these things will eventually end up benefiting you in the end. Um, and so I think, I think no matter what it is, a sub I, a, you know, anything, you've done all this hard work to set all these things up. You just have to be ready to hit it hard um, when you get there and really knock all these opportunities for home runs. And, um, and then when you're sitting there with the other groups of applicants at the interviews, I don't think anything, anyone will hold that against you. I think it'll be a positive um, if you've really accomplished a lot as an IMG. Um, and, and I think people reward you. The only other final thing I'd say is two things. Uh, we have a webinar for the young neurosurgeons that is available on YouTube. You can Google it, um, the Young Neurosurgeons in Rep webinar series, the second episode goes through a lot of the match statistics, which are relevant to international, magic, international graduates as well as US graduates. Um, secondly, there's another webinar, which uh, has been mentioned several times, the word resilience. And um, we just had a webinar with University of Buffalo's Elad Levy and Renee Reynolds talking about resilience and um, grit. And I think a lot, a lot of the things we talked about today come down to smart planning, resilience and grit and hard work. Um, so that may be another one you guys want to check out just as a resource. And, um, and those are the majority of my thoughts. I think it's possible. There's clearly examples of people that have done it very well. And I think this is a really important conversation that should help a lot of people that are trying to figure out how to, how to do this and if they want to tackle it and these types of things. Luck certainly favors the prepared. Um, and we'll have the rest of the, uh, all the links and everything posted on the website. Um, that you guys think is relevant to today's conversation. Um, Panos and Greg, thank you so much for being on. I think this is really valuable. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, have this discussion with you guys. Yeah, thank you. I, I enjoyed this uh, very much. I could talk about this for hours. Uh, <laughs> it's an important, an important subject for sure. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, Please subscribe, follow, and leave a comment in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your audio content. Make sure to follow MSNTC and the YNC on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And check out our webpage at neurosurgerytraining.org slash TNJ, where you can find other episodes and links and resources related to today's conversation. Be sure to check out the YNC's webinar series and visit their webpage on AANS.org. If you have comments or ideas for episodes or would like to join us to talk about anything neurosurgery related, our email address is tnjpodcast at neurosurgerytraining.org. We'd love to hear from you. Finally, I'd like to thank Matt Rosenthal, one of our fantastic MSNTC volunteers, for helping with the editing and processing, and also thank all the fabulous people involved in this project. Have a great day, and we look forward to next time. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.